صلاه والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى خصوصا على افضلهم وخاتم النبيين محمد الامين وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين وبعد we begin with Allah's blessed name we praise him and we glorify him as he ought to be praised and glorified and we pray for peace and for blessings on all his noble messengers and in particular on the last day the last of them all the blessed prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in his kindness he gave us glorious sunshine yesterday beautiful sunshine yesterday and cool weather and now today we have a cloudy day we thank him for it as well there are those who look at the dunya today and the dunya is not the sunshine and the clouds and the rain the dunya is the world and they say that this is the best world has ever been it's never been better all that came before have now been superseded by the best and they have been sent to the museum of history and that includes Islam. They are moribund in Toynbee's words, Arnold Toynbee, and this is the best of all worlds. And every day, every day it grows better and yet better. But we who are gathered here in this, the second international Islamic retreat here in beautiful Cape Town, we see the world differently because we try to see with two eyes while they see with one. And when we see with two eyes, we say, no, this is the worst world there's ever been. This is the world which has turned away from Allah. This is a world which is defying the one who created us all. This is a world which has taken every single law that he has set and broken it. This is a world which is just waiting to be destroyed. This is the worst world ever. That's their view, and that's ours. Because they see with one eye, and we see with two, and that was last night's lecture. Islamic spirituality, and the changing world, and the end times. Who is the mastermind of this control demolition job? that around the world society is collapsing. How is he doing it? Hmm? For surely it is collapsing around the world. And uh, Ambassador Adlan Rose, who has traveled as an ambassador to so many parts of the world and is seeing their eyes from his perspective as a diplomat, has come to tell us about it. <coughs> and this morning, we go to the Quran, that the Quran might explain the strange world that is being corrupted, that is being dismantled, that is being destroyed. We go to the Quran that the Quran might explain the universal, listen to the word, the universal facade, which has embraced the whole world. It could not have been by accident. No. We want an answer. The companions were sitting talking amongst themselves when he, the Prophet came and asked, what are you talking about? And they said, we're talking about the signs of the last day. 
And then he answered the hadith in Sahih Bukhari, it is in Sahih Muslim, Muttafaqan Ali. He said the last day would not come until, and he mentioned ten signs. If you don't know those ten, we're going to ship you back home. <laughs> They're known as the ten major signs. <laughs> And as a consequence, the others are known as a minor sign, but I don't see anything minor about them. Hmm? And they're not given to us in the chronological sequence in which they will occur. Which one comes first and which one comes second and which one comes third? What are they? Number one, the Dajjal, the false messiah. Number two, Gog and Magog, Yajud and Majud. Number three, the return of the son of Mary. Number four, Dukhan, smoke, clouds up there. Number five, Dab, Batul Ab, beast or a creature of the Ard, which is up, which is also land. Number six, that the sun would rise from the west. Keep down, from which direction does it rise? <laughs> Number seven, eight, and nine. Three, khusuf, plural of khas. And I thought that khas was an earthquake in which the earth sinks down. Dr. Tamam Adi, the Syrian Uh, scholar of Quranic semantics. He says, no, Imran. A khas is not just an earthquake in which the earth sinks down. It has to be a shaking, moving. And then you also have the sinking. Something like what happened in Japan recently. Three khusuf, one in the east, one in the west, and the third one in Arabia. Arabia. And then number five, number ten, that the a fire will come out of Yemen and drive people to their place of assembly, which is Arafat. We're going to look this morning, and we're doing it rapidly because you're all familiar with my lectures already. <coughs> You've done your homework before coming. We're going to look this morning rapidly at Gog and Magog. Yeah, Jewish and Majud. Who are they? Are they human beings? <coughs> Or are they some strange creatures with two dozen ears and four dozen noses and six or eight hands on each side? What, who are they? Are they from some outer planet or do they reside down in the bowel of the earth? Who? Are they? Let the Quran answer that question. In Surah Al Kaf of the Quran, we are told, Inna yajuja wa majuja mufsiduna fil aqqag and magal are perpetrating fasad. Fasad is not just a sin. Fasad is a crime. It is criminal conduct. For a sin, punishment is over there. But for a crime, punishment is also over here. And the punishment for fasad is the worst in the Quran. It, it, it is graded. It, you can be banished. You can be, you can have your hands and your feet cut off on opposite sides. And you can be crucified. And if you are crucified and when they bring down your body, you pick up your briefcase and you walk away, you come back, you're not yet crucified. You're not yet crucified. Because this crucifixion of this punishment which is in the Quran 
is most certainly not to be just put, put for five minutes on a cross, on a, on a tree, and then you can bring him down. That's not crucifixion. Not in the Quran. You have to die, then that you crucify. In the Quran. Outside of the Quran, there are many strange things, I know. But this is the Quran. Who can <coughs> commit an act of facade? Who are Gog and Magog? Can't be an angel. Why? Because angels have no free will. They cannot disobey. They commit no sin. <laughs> so Gog and Magog cannot be angels. Other than angels, who else have been created by Allah? Only jinn and human beings. And so Gog and Magog can either be angels or jinn or human beings. If not, we probably are creatures of whom we have no knowledge because Allah makes no mention of them. No knowledge. If Allah makes no mention of them, then this Quran has come to explain all things. So this Quran must explain Gog and Magog. Can they be jinn? Yes, jinn can commit sin and jinn will be judged on the day of judgment and jinn will be in heaven or in hell. There are jinn who are Muslims and there are jinn who are shayateen. But Gog and Magog cannot be jinn. Because jinn are invisible creatures. And if you are being attacked by jinn who are committing facade in your land, and you build a barrier built of material substance, how would a material wall protect you from the jinn? And that's what Zulkarnain did. He built a barrier built of, um, was it recycled paper? <laughs> <laughs> no, it was iron. Zubarul Hadi. And a barrier built with iron offers no protection from the jinn. And so the conclusion we arrive at is that there's only one other creator, creation. In all of creation, one other which can commit sin, which is a crime, and who can be contained behind the material barrier, because they're material beings. And so we conclude that Gog and Magog are human beings, and we only use the Quran so far. When we go to the Hadith, the Prophet wasalam, said that the Ya'juj and Ma'juj are from Banu Adam. They are, from, they are the progeny of Adam alayhi salam. They are human beings. So that completes that discussion. No need to go and search in the bowel of the earth. No need to go and search anywhere else in the skies. They are human beings. The rabbis in Medina who ask, how can we tell whether he is indeed a prophet of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? And they said, ask him these three questions which only a prophet can answer. And one of the questions was, ask him about the great travel, traveler who traveled to the two ends of the earth. The Quran answered the question and gave the information about the journey to one side and the journey to the second side. But that was not the target of the question. Allah knew the target of the question. And so Allah gave them the journey, which was the third one. And that journey, in the third direction, gave us one of the signs of the last day. Major sign. It was one of the signs of the last day. Major signs of the last day, Gog and Magog. So the target of the question was Gog and Magog. Does he know about Gog and Magog? 
Wayasaluna ka'an lil karnayn. And they questioned me about someone who is called the possessor, possessor of karnayn, either two horns or who impacts on two ages. It appears to mean two ages here because otherwise the Quran uses karn for an age, not for a horn. He travels in the direction of the setting of the sun. And then he travels in the direction of the rising of the sun. And then he travels in a third direction. Which was it? That is west. And this one is east. Which is the third one? Hmm? We know the third one. Why? Because Nabi Muhammad Islam said that when they are released, they will pass by the Sea of Galilee on the way to Jerusalem. Jerusalem. And there in Jerusalem, they will surround the mountain, which is in Baytul Maqdis. That's what the hadith says. And Nabi Isa will be up the mountain. So if you're traveling, passing the Sea of Galilee on your way to Jerusalem, you're coming from the north. You did study geography, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> All right. When he traveled in the direction of the setting of the sun, he, he could go no further because he came upon a body of water, which was hamia, dark and murky. So now we're looking for a body of water to the left of the Holy Land, are going north. And there are only two. One is the Mediterranean Sea, which is not Hamia. Because you can look down and you can see meters down. But north of the Mediterranean Sea, there is precisely such a body of water. It is even known as the Black Sea. Because it is Hamia. So much algae in the water that you visibility is very, very uh, difficult. Just about one meter you can see. And our Mufassirun long years ago identified this. Identified it as the Black Sea. You find it in Tafsir ibn Kathir. And they come across a people. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who created <coughs> Zulkarnain and bestowed upon him power. Power to pursue any objective he would he chooses to pursue. He is the superpower. But he has faith in Allah. And so when power found, is founded, power rests on the foundations of faith. How will power be used? And the Quran now gives a beautiful explanation. Zulkarnain replies to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I have a little difficulty in having that fellow called Alexander, that you call Alexander the Great, having a conversation with Allah. I have a little difficulty with that. <laughs> Allah speaks to him and he speaks to Allah. Alexander, the fellow who worshipped more than Greek gods and goddesses. Yeah. So, Zulkarnain replies to Allah and he says, those who commit acts of zulm, who are unjust, who oppress, who are wicked in their country, I'm going to punish them. And so power, when it rests on the foundation of the faith, is used to punish the oppressor. And when they return to you, you will also punish them. And so when power rests on the foundations of faith, there is an essential harmony between this world here and that world there. What a wonderful world in which to live. And those who have faith and who are righteous in conduct, I'll treat them nicely and they will be rewarded. So when power rests on the foundations of faith, power is used to support and to protect those who have faith and who are righteous in conduct. The Quran is teaching a lesson. And then he travels in the direction of the rising of the sun. So if you move east, 
from the Black Sea. How far can you go? As you move east from the Black Sea, you're going to come upon another sea beyond which you can't go. What's the name of that sea? The Caspian Sea. You're lucky I don't have time to ask you questions. <laughs> the Caspian Sea. And there he came across the people and now we see the <coughs> very few words, agonizingly few in the Quran. He came across a people Lam Najalahum Mindu Niha Sitra. Just only these words? Could you not have given us some more? Lam Najalahum Mindu Niha Sitra. A sitra is a covering that which covers. Other than that, we gave them no, no more covering. Other than that, we gave them no covering. So now we are forced. We are forced. There is no way we can get away from it. We are forced to dig, dig deep to try to determine what is the message being sent. And when we come to a conclusion, of course, we must say Allah knows best. There's no obligation to accept our understanding. Could be. Here are a people who are sitting on a vast sea of oil. When power rests on the foundations of faith, and you come across such a people, you want to exploit the oil. I mean, it's valuable. And these are just human beings then. What do you do? You pick them up and you ship them to Brazil. Mm -hmm. eh? So you can exploit all the oil. Or, alternatively, these are people who are living an essentially primitive way of life. Only the natural covering, that's all that they have from the elements. What do you do when you come across such a people? Do you take them out of that natural way of life and put them into something, I don't know whether you've seen it, something called blue jeans. <laughs> so become part of the blue jeans jamaat. Huh? And get them to start smoking cigarettes and Civilize them. What do you do? Kazali. Wakada Hatna Bima Dalayi Kubra. Kazali, one word. Sheikh Ali Mustafa, only one word. That's all. This whole card name had the, had the compassion. He had the good sense, he had the integrity to leave them as they were undisturbed. This is the, this is the understanding that we get from the tapasir. Hmm? But we are struggling with just a few words. Economy of language has reached its perfection here in this passage of Surah Al-Qadhalik. Allah says, I understood perfectly why he acted in the way that he did. And so when power rests on the foundations of faith, power will place human values first before economic values and the, risk, and the exploitation of the economic resources of the world. The human being comes first. When power rests on the foundations of faith, power will respect the way of life of even those who live the primitive way. What a wonderful world it could have been. Huh? And then he travels in the third direction, which is to the north. But when we look from that Black Sea to this, the Caspian Sea, and now we have the firm foundations of geography. Huh? When we go north, 
there is an unbroken barrier of mountains. What are they called? What are they called? Caucasus Mountains. An unbroken barrier of mountains. But this unbroken barrier of mountains has a little pass in between them. A solitary pass. Where you can pass through from the north to go down to the south. And there he comes across a people it's a very important clue now. Their language could not be understood. Indicating that this is a language which is unique, unrelated to the regional languages. An important clue. The Georgian language fits the bill perfectly. The Georgian language is right there in that region by the Caucasus Mountains. And the Georgian language is unconnected with all the regional languages. Hmm? See how we're moving forward? They say to Zulkarnain in the Yajujama Jujamusiduna Philop, Gog and Magog are committing perpetrating facade in our land. Can you help us? Can you build a barrier for us? We're prepared to pay you to protect us from them. One would have expected Zulkarnain to say, I don't need to build any barrier. I'll just move in there and teach them the lesson of their life. They'll be scared to even put their finger on you after I'm finished with them. <laughs> but he didn't say that. And so now we have a profile of Gog and Magog coming out of the Quran. We have not gone to the Hadith as yet that he is the superpower and yet he does not as the superpower of the world he does not have the power to be able to go there go into them and teach them a lesson <coughs> they have a power greater than his and all that he can do with Allah's help is to build a barrier he says I don't need your money what Allah has given to me is good enough just help me with manpower. Bring me blocks of iron. So it has to be a region with iron ore deposits. That is the Caucasus mountain around there. And after he had cut the iron blocks and put them on the mountain pass, the Quran describes فَلَمَّا سَاوَ بَيْنَ السَّدَفَيْنِ Sadafain. Not by accident, eh? The clues are coming one after the other so fast they're coming. If you take a shell and you open it, you get Sadafain. This side and that side join at the bottom. Huh? Like this. So Zulkarnain is describing to us the shape of the pass, Sadafain, like the sides of an open shell that are joined at the bottom. That is pre up to this day you can go and see the same shape is there. It's called the Dariel Gorge. We are on very firm geographical foundations here. Yeah. Very firm. So he builds a barrier with blocks of iron. We do have to go and search for the barrier in Singapore. No! That's where it is. And after she hit the barrier, it's not called Sud anymore. The Sud is a barrier to patch something. It's now called Radam, which is like a dam you build to create a dam. This is important. It's important. Because in the hadith you'll not find the word sad, you'll find the word radam. Good. After he built it, he said, now blow with your bellows. Build a fire, blow with your bellows. 
And now he poured keto, molten copper on the barrier. And uh, Masabo, who is the engineer here, will tell you it prevents rust. After the barrier was built, Gog and Magog could neither penetrate nor could they scale the barrier. Then Zulkarnain said, Hada rahmatu mi rabbi. This barrier is constructed successfully with Allah's help as mercy from Allah. Hada rahmatu mi rabbi. Fa idha jaa wa'adu rabbi ja'alahu dakkaa. Could Alexander, who worshipped the Greek gods and goddesses, could say, could he say this? Huh? When will they wake up? He said, when that time comes of which my Lord has won, he is going to bring down this barrier. He is going to do it. وَكَانَ وَعْدُ رَبِّ حَقَّةً And then the warning of my Lord will come to pass. Gog and Magog are going to be set loose in the world. And since they have PhDs in facade, now we understand. The demolition, the demolition job going on around the world today can only have one explanation, only one. This is the explanation. When they are released into the world, what kind of world will it be? Hmm? This is why you have the word Karnain. Two horns or two ages. If you, under, if you take the two ages as the meaning, that was one age. <coughs> and what a world it could have been. And now this is the second age. Because I have created creatures of mine so powerful that none but I can destroy them. This is Hadith al Qudsi, direct speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Sahih Muslim. And so, power in the world now, power in the world. Power which cannot be challenged, <laughs> no, will now be released and this power will rest on foundations which have to be godless to be agents of facade. Because godly people, righteous people don't act in that way. And so power will now be used in a manner which is opposite from that first age. In that first age, power rested on the foundations of faith and power was used to punish the oppressor. Remember? And now power will be used, power which rests on foundations which are godless, power will be used to oppress. Are you beginning to understand the world in which we live today? That one is a power you can trust because it is on foundations of godliness. And anyone who has the truth in his heart must have the truth on his lips. So you can trust him. But now this one, there are three categories of lies. Did you know about it? There are lies. And then there are great lies, and then there is 9-11. This is the world in which we now live. And then that one is one in which power, which rested on the foundations of faith was used to protect those who have faith and who are righteous in conduct and assist them. 
And this is one which targets those who have faith and who are righteous in conducts and demonizes them and terrorizes them and sends them to a place called Guantanamo. Do you see the difference between the two? And now, what about the journey to the east? That one, even, the, even if these were a primitive people, but they were living in a land below which there is a whole basin of oil. And that precisely, of course, is Caspian Sea. Eh? Caspian Sea is a huge basin of oil. With Zulkarnain, he left them undisturbed because the human person was more valuable than the oil. But the new world of Gog and Magog says, no, human beings are like cockroaches. You don't have to bother of them. And this new world is, is, is essentially racist. Racist to the core. And they're not like us. So they are dispensable. The oil is what we want. And we go after the oil without regard for human rights. Or they are people who are living a primitive way of life. So they only take from the earth enough for, ed for their daily sustenance. And they show reverence for rivers. And they would be horrified, absolutely horrified, to find a people taking all the sewage from a town and pumping it into a river. Are these human beings? Or are they some satanic force? This is how that primitive man would respond. Hmm? And now these people come who are agents of facade and say, we will not allow you to live that way. And so they take them out of the setting in which they are living, the primitive way of life. And bring them into what I call the blue jeans, Jamaat. And so we have two ages. We have that age and we have this age. And you can now understand the world in which you live and you can now look back to see the world that you could have lived in. Hmm? This is the Quran addressing mankind. If only we'll take a little time to go to the Quran. Have they been released? Or are they still behind the barrier? Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu was salam is asleep at the home of his wife Zainab radiallahu ta'ala anha. And he sees something in his sleep and the hadith is, is in Sahih Bukhari I think about six, eight times. Different versions. He sees something in his sleep which is terrible, 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 terrible. And he wakes up from his sleep, it's a vision, eh? and his face is flushed red. What did he see? And he says to her, Wailul in Arab, min sharrin kadiktara. Go unto the Arabs. Because of a great evil which has now been released, now it's going to be, it's close upon them. And then he raised his hand like this and he said, today a hole has been made in the radam. That's the word used, radam. That Zulkar named it because they had asked for a son and he built a radam. So Nabi Muhammad uses the word radam. Today a hole has been built indicating that the release of Gog and Magog, which can only take place when Allah chooses. 
the release has now commenced, so the barrier is going down. She then asked, Anuhrika, will we be destroyed? And there are righteous people living amongst <coughs> us. He said, Naam, we meaning the Arabs, eh? Because he said, Wailu lil Arab. Will we be destroyed when there are righteous people living amongst us? He said, Naam. Iza kathur al khabath. When khabath, nastiness, immorality, what, what today can be called moral garbage, <laughs> when it prevails, at that time, the destruction of the Arabs will take place. We are now living on the very brink of the destruction of the Arabs. On the very brink of it. It's a terrible time coming ahead of us. And so from the Hadith in Sahih Bukhari, it is as plain as daylight. And from our examination of the world around us, it is as plain as daylight that Allah brought down that barrier long years ago. The Gog and Magog, who are human beings? So you can't recognize them by looking at them. You have to recognize them by their conduct. Or you could use the word footprints, no? By their conduct. That's how you recognize them. They've been released long ago. But if you say they have not been released, then I have the right to ask, where is the barrier? You don't even need to travel to the Caucasus Mountains. There's something called the Internet now. You may have heard of it. And something called Google Earth. <laughs> And you could just, Imam, you could just type and Caucasus Mountains right there on the screen. And you could move around, you get Dariel Gorge. And when you look, it's a, it's a big military highway now from Russia coming down south. Barrier is not there anymore. If you say that you cannot have your cake and eat it at the same time. If you say that Gog and Magog have not been released. The barrier is still there, which is the majority opinion, unfortunately. And I show no disrespect for my brothers, the learned scholars of Islam. That's not my style. I made a mistake once in Perth. I said, they're eating halwa. <laughs> and then Perth scolded me, and I've not done it again. <laughs> if you say, that the barrier is still there, that they have not been released. And I explained to you why they say that. Then we have the right to respectfully ask them, where is the barrier? And why are you not making an effort to go and search for such a historic, such a historic construction which is in the Quran? If it is still standing there, how can you eat biryani for dinner and go to sleep? Huh? Why are we in this situation? I have been lecturing on the subject of Gog and Magog for more than 15 years now. When I started in New York, people looked at me and asked whether this man has come from Mars or Venus. Or... You couldn't believe what it was like 15 years ago. Really? Because nobody, nobody, nobody was speaking on this subject. Not, no. And I am in the United States of America. And you got the whole world of Islam in New York, you know. Everybody there. Oh, every single Muslim community of the world is present in New York. And here comes this curious fellow called Imran. Fellow called Imran. Talking about Gog and Magog. We never heard about it before. And of course, the majority, absolute majority of the scholars 
overwhelming majority of the scholars are saying, no, he's wrong. He's wrong. Gog and Magog have, cannot be released. The barrier is still standing. Why did they hold this opposition? Why? We have a problem of methodology. At the very beginning of the Quran, Allah teaches a lesson. But it has escaped the attention of many of us. He says that he ordered the angels to bow down to Adam alayhi salam. Fasajadu illa iblis. This is not, this sentence is not constructed by accident. No. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not deficient in the use of language. No. There is a reason why this sentence is constructed like this. He ordered the angels to bow, to prostrate. And they all prostrated. In other parts of the Quran, Jamia, they all prostrated. Illa Iblis. If you take a verse of the Quran in isolation, or you take a hadith in isolation, the Americans call it standalone. You'll have to come to the conclusion inescapably that Iblis is an angel. Can't get away from that. Can't get this is the defective metho methodology. Iblis is an angel. In fact, in my early years as a student, when I was green, I remained green for a long time. Huh? I was also battling with it. But it has to be, it has to be an angel. And then I went dabbling into Christian teaching. They talk about a fallen angel. Oh, he fell down. <laughs> because we had not as yet been grounded in methodology. But when you go to the rest of the Quran, you say, hey, wait a minute, I made a mistake there. Because here Allah speaks about the angels. They don't have any free will. They don't have any self-directed will. They don't have choice. They have to do whatever they are told to do. So if they are a a creation which must obey, no choice in the matter. And this fellow disobeyed. It looks as though he wasn't an angel. Eh? Maybe I made a mistake. Eh? Oh my gosh. This is a rotten methodology. <laughs> to take a person to God in isolation. And then, of course, Allah confirmed it all. When, he, when I went to Surah al kaf I saw it there straight, straight in my face. This is not by accident. This is the Lord of the heavens and the earth teaching methodology for study, for the pursuit of knowledge. Do not make the, act, the mistake of taking any verse of the Qur'an or any hadith or anything in isolation and coming to a conclusion. You could be correct, but you could also be wrong. And sometimes when you make a mistake, that's it for you. You damage forever and ever. We can't trust you anymore. And that's what, unfortunately, they have done. There's one hadith, only one, in Sahih Muslim. But after Nabi Isa alayhi salam returns, <coughs> the true Messiah will kill the false Messiah. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will, فَبَعَثَ اللَّهُ 
يأجوج أو مأجوج بعثة but the Quran uses a different word for release in Surah Al-Anbiya إذا فتحت فتحت يأجوج أو مأجوج when Gog and Magog are released they're opened that is the release and Ba'atha means to send or to raise. Well, it couldn't mean to raise here. Why? Because they've been raised long ago. And they were committing fasad long before we built the barrier. So it has to mean Allah will send Gog and Magog at that time. And the first of them will pass by the Sea of Galilee and start to drink the water. And by the time the last of them pass, they'll say, there used to be water here. Where is Amir? Oh, there he is. <coughs> from Haifa not, not from Haifa in Palestine in the Holy Land and for the last two years he's been monitoring the water level and sending me reports constantly my student I mean the Sea of Galilee is almost dry did you know that? it has now reached a level where it can no longer be revived so it's essentially dead waiting to dry up I think that qualifies as a little bit of proof, isn't it? That something is happening here? I think that qualifies as evidence that there is some kind of a passage there for Gog and Magog. Hmm? But because the hadith says that after Nabi Isa Islam killed that job, their understanding is that only at that time will Allah bring down the barrier <coughs> and only at that time will Gog and Magog be released. And Imran Hussein is a voice crying in the wilderness for 15 years now. <laughs> 15 years now. A voice crying in the wilderness. But you cannot be angry with your brothers. They are more learned than you are. All that we can do is to pray that someone will tell them this is wrong methodology. When you go to the Quran to find out when will the barrier come down. Remember we only have a hadith eh? in Sahih Bukhari about the vision while he was sleeping. When we go to the Quran, when will Allah bring down the barrier? We find in Surah Al-Anbiya the verse of all verses. In fact, there are two verses. وَحَرَامٌ عَلَى قَرْيَةٍ أَهْلَكْنَاهَا Notice this is the only passage of the Quran I recite word by word. وَحَرَامٌ على قرية أهلكناها أنهم لا يرجعون a قرية and Allah destroyed it and we know that before the end Allah is going to destroy all وإن من قرية not a single one will escape. Wa min qariyatin illa nahnu muhlikuha qabla yawm al-qiyamah aw mu'adhibuha azaban shadida wa kana thalika fi al-kitab mastura suratul suratul Surah Al-Isra, otherwise known as Surah Al-Bani Israel. Every single town and city will be destroyed and those who escape destruction will be inflicted with terrible punishment. But this is a subject that is must do. There's a cover over it. When Allah lifts the cover, then you see that. This is a town or a city and Allah destroyed it. 
And having destroyed it, the people were expelled. And And then he put a ban on them that they can never return to this town or city to reclaim it as their own. Hatta. Until until when? Ida Futihat until Gog and Magog are released by Allah. Wahum in Kulli Hadabin Yan Silun. And they descend from every height or they spread out in every direction. Both the meanings are admissible. Which town? Which city is it? You will go to the Quran, it will not tell you. You've got a homework to do. You'll go to the Prophet and Islam, he will not tell you. You've got homework to do. But when you take the totality of the data in the Qur'an on this subject of the signs of the last day, because Gog and Magog is here, and you ask which town is it, then there's only one answer to the question. It has to be Jerusalem that the city of Jerusalem was destroyed and Banu Israel were expelled, the state of Israel was destroyed, and for 2,000 years they could not return. <coughs> no, they could not return. Allah put a ban on them. But when he was drowning underneath the water, then he realized that he wasn't God. You know, previously he said, Ana Rabbukum al -ala. I am the Lord Most High. But when he was drowning underneath the water, he said, Oh my gosh, I'm not God. <laughs> I am not God. So then he declared his faith in the God of Banu Israel. So Allah said, Al Ad, now Fir'aun, Waqal Asaita Kabla, and before this you were in obstinate rejection, Wakunda Minal Musili, and you were committing fasad. For Yomanu Najika bi Badanik. This day we have decided, we have ordained to preserve your physical body. لِتَكُونَ لِمَنْ خَلْفَكَ آيَةً So that your physical, so that your physical body, when it is rediscovered, when it resurfaces in the historical process, will be an ayah, a sign, for a people to come after you, a people who live the way you lived and who will die the way you died. At the last moment, when it's too late, then they will say, now we believe. And they'll die like that, the way he died. And go into the hellfire. But most people are too busy. Too busy to bother about my signs unfolding in the world. Hmm? The body of Fir'aun was discovered at the end of the 19th century. The Zionist movement was established at precisely that moment. And so now, the people of the town are going to be brought back. And there's a divine hand in this. <laughs> it's not acting by accident. Huh? And so they come back after 2,000 years. Who is bringing them back? If you can see who are bringing them back, you can identify Gog and Magog. Gog and Magog. Yeah. And if you want to know the origins of Gog and Magog, because they're constantly expanding, because they're spreading out, okay, in all directions. So the original Gog and Magog would be small in number, but 
eventually you're going to have Pakistani Gog and Magog. <laughs> you're going to have Japanese Gog and Magog. You're going to have Chinese Gog and Magog. Okay? But the original Gog and Magog are the ones where the center of power is located. This is only the periphery. Islam Bavali is the periphery. Where is the center? Where is the center? We say that it is Gog and Magog who attack Christian European civilization, which was Christendom, and transformed it into godless modern Western civilization. We say this is the civilization of Gog and Magog. And it is this civilization which now possesses a power which cannot, cannot be rivaled. It is this civilization which uses military power to attack, as uh, Ambassador Adlan Rose was speaking about, the period of military conquest of the rest of the world, and then the colonization of the rest of the world, and then the decolonization. They are the ones who brought back Banu Israel to the town to reclaim it as their own. And so there is Gog and Magog. But originally you have to look at the Caucasus Mountains. And when we do that we find that it is the Khaza, K-H-A-Z-A-R, who converted to Judaism shortly after the time of the Prophet And so now you have a curious creature, they don't like me for this, a curious creature emerges in history who is not Semitic. He's most certainly not a cousin of the Arabs. He is European. But he's also a Jew. Oh? Can you have such a thing as a European Jew? I thought they were from the seed of Ibrahim Islam through Ishaq Islam. I thought they were Banu Israel. Not only is the European Jew something unique amongst Jews, but if you do a genetic test on him, you see the evidence staring at you that he is genetically unique in the world. No other people, no other people are like him, the European Jew. Hmm? And so we have identified for you that the Khaza who are the original have become Jews and some of them also became Christians. And I believe some of them also became Muslim, so let me speak softly. <laughs> <laughs> the end of it all is that they're going to have a grand, mighty clash between Gog and Magog. And the last speaks of it. Like waves crashing against each other. It can also mean merging with each other, which explains globalization around the world today, one global society. But the other meaning is the one I want to concentrate on now. The clash that will take place. You have my book somewhere around there, An Islamic View of Gog and Magog in the Modern World. Mm -hmm. There is this mighty clash that is going to take place. I don't want to spoil your tea, eh? But when we examine to identify them today, there is no question but Magog is Russia mm -hmm. and the alliance with Russia. And therefore Gog will have to be the Anglo-American-Israeli alliance. And when they clash, it's not going to be with bows and arrows or not. It's going to be nuclear weapons and not thermonuclear weapons and only those can produce Dukhan. And most of mankind are going to die. But I don't think the heavens will be weeping for most of them. Because they have eyes and yet they don't see. 
They have ears and yet they don't hear. They have hearts and yet they don't understand. The Quran is in the world, but they don't read the Quran and study it. So they're just like cattle. Most of mankind are going to die when this clash takes place. After that, self-destruction, huh? mutual self-destruction. The state of Israel will be defenseless. And then comes the army from Khorasan. And it's not a Muslim army that will destroy Israel. Because Israel will already be broken. At that time, said the Prophet, Sahih Bukhari. You're going to fight them, the Jews. And you will kill them, you will defeat them. Not all Jews. No, don't take a hadith in isolation. When you go to the totality of the Quran, you'll find if there are Jews who stand with you and condemn Israel, there are such Jews. They're there in Brooklyn. They support the oppressed. How can you say that these are Jews who are referred to in this hadith? So not all Jews. At that time the stones will speak. Ya Muslim. They're going to be on the run. So this is not a confrontation, a military confrontation where we will then destroy Israel because they're going to be on the run. They're going to be hiding behind trees and stones. So the breaking of the power of Israel will take place with the Gog and Magog clash. It is after this. Now I left taught something before that. After the Jal is killed, which is our next lecture, then Gog and Magog, the clash will take place. They will surround Nabi Isa al-Islam in Bait al-Maqdis. They say, we've killed all those who are on earth, now let's kill all those who are in the heavens above. So they're going to be military warfare above. Space. It's called Star Wars. Yes. <laughs> and then Nabi Isa al-Islam will pray to Allah. And he will destroy Gog and Magog. And something will attack them at the back of the necks, the top of the spine. And we have some medical doctors here, so you've got homework to do now. And they fall down paralyzed. Could be that the immune system was devastated. And the smallest, tiniest attack could cause you to be paralyzed. And they die and by next morning their bodies are rotting. And Allah will then send prehistoric birds with huge necks and pick up these bodies and have them disposed where Allah will have them disposed. This is the end of Gog and Magog. But after that comes the destruction, the finishing off of the state of Israel, and then the Khilafah is restored in Jerusalem. And the truth triumphs over falsehood, and justice triumphs over injustice and oppression. I'm sorry that I had to race with this. I normally don't race like this. But we wanted to finish in one hour, and we finish in an hour and five minutes. So you can have your tea now. Rabbana